as you had um Kennedy Murebe working at uh, Old Pejeta Conservancy based at the conservation tech lab within uh, the technology department. So it's my pleasure to be uh, giving this talk and uh, speaking on uh, how to set up mm -hmm. camera traps or how to use camera traps for wildlife monitoring. Uh, hopefully uh, this session will be of benefit to you and I'll go right ahead. I'll begin by speaking a bit about uh, Old Pejeta Conservancy. So it's a 90,000 acre uh, conservation area. We have the last two Northern White Rhinos. We also are a chimpanzee sanctuary. And uh, we have the big five uh, as well. So the green area is where uh, the mammals that we have uh, roam freely, and the gray sections are exclusion zones. So uh, it's in the central part of Kenya, as you can see on the, sc on the screen. And I, I think one of our core mandates is conservation. So, uh, and how we, part of conservation is monitoring, and that's how camera traps come in. Okay. So uh, moving on, as I mentioned, we have a diverse, uh, vast uh, actually amount of animals or other diverse species of animals within the conservancy, uh, which we actively monitor. So we monitor, for instance, uh, the demographics. So which uh, do we have males or females uh, of which particular species? We monitor the ranging behavior of these species. We monitor the interaction, uh, diversity. Uh, for example, we are keen to know how this particular species interact with one another, what is their home ranges. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's, and monitoring that happens uh, at the conservancy. All right. So, uh, there are multiple methods. I, I, when I joined, I met uh, the discussion being on uh, acoustics. Uh, so that's one me method of uh, monitoring. There's also uh, camera trapping. There's also tracking. So, but why why camera trapping? So uh, that's what I'll talk about today, and uh, maybe give a bit of details uh, on what camera traps are to begin with, or and how they work and their usefulness and uh, advantages and disadvantages. So camera traps have been around for over 100 years with uh, their popularity rising in the early 90s. Uh, what a camera trap is, is what you can see, uh, the image you can see uh, uh, on the right of the slide. So a camera trap has multiple parts. It has a digital camera, which is this point, labeled digital camera. It has a flash array. So the flash array is used uh, to highlight, or for example, it can be either uh, infrared or white. It's essentially similar to a flash of a normal camera. It just once, uh, so the camera works by motion trigger. So once a trigger has been detected and the camera is taking a photo, it uses that flash. Uh, I mentioned that the camera works by a motion trigger, so it does have a sensor that uh, detects that, a movement sensor or a heat sensor. Uh, that is useful because then the camera can be able to tell if there's movement in its field of view. And uh, if there is, then it captures that as a photo or a video. Uh, the test light allows you when deploying to be able to see uh, that the camera, the angle, how you have set the, the camera up, um, it's as intended, meaning that uh, the field of view that you want to look at, if you do a test by, for example, working in that field of view, that light will come on, telling you that uh, the camera does indeed capture your movement. So uh, camera traps are usually powered by batteries, although there are some that have solar boxes and uh, solar panels attached that allow you to deploy them for longer. But uh, 
most have uh, batteries. So you can use either rechargeable batteries on or non-rechargeable batteries. We use rechargeable batteries because then uh, you save on the costs of battery replacement and then you can reuse these batteries frequently based on need. The camera, of course, uh, captures photos and this needs to be stored somewhere. And uh, it's, it's stored, uh, the storage point is the memory card or SD card. So, so uh, these cameras can support SD cards up to 32 GB, newer ones, I think, go up to 64 GB. And that allows you to deploy your camera out in the field uh, for long periods of time and capture uh, those photos in a card that can be retrieved and uh, you can get your photos for analysis or review later. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what advantages do camera traps offer as a tool of wildlife monitoring? So you're able to capture accurate data it's uh, meaning that you can be able to prove uh, to, uh, let's say, different parties that what you're actually saying is true. So you can show them a photo, for instance, this is a photo of an ad work, and you can be able to say that there is actual evidence that an ad work uses or is present in that area. Whereas if you just said you observed it, then it would be difficult to actually show proof to anybody they would have to trust your word and, say, uh, and trust what you're saying is true. Of course, uh, camera traps are less intrusive uh, of a monitoring tool, meaning uh, it's not, for example, if you compare it to things like uh, animal trackers or uh, such technologies, then you, you don't put it on an animal. You deploy it in, a, in an area, for example, on a tree or on a, post and then it doesn't affect the movement or you don't put it uh, directly on an animal. So that is uh, not as intrusive as say technologies such as tracking. So that is an advantage because then you can monitor, you can monitor multiple species using one or multiple, in fact, uh, yeah, multiple species using one, one camera and one technology. Of course it's, it's silent and operates uh, however long you have it deployed it, it's it's an it's a silent operation and that that is indeed a benefit i mentioned earlier that you can show proof so the image is proof of your work you can be able to tell other parties whatever you are talking about is true because you can then show them that image uh, so for in all Pegeta, we have uh camera traps at the corridors and uh in those corridors, uh, corridors essentially are gaps along the fence line that allow animals to move through those gaps. So when they move, uh, they leave prints and we use uh, these camera traps to compare those prints with the photos uh, captured. So for example, if you look at a print and you are wondering what that animal is, you can review the photos to determine uh, which animal actually used that corridor. So such, such review then uh, acts as evidence for management and uh, can lead to policy decisions within the conservancy. Uh, so how do we, uh, how are camera traps applied uh, or what's the application of camera traps in, in research? So you can use camera traps to help uh, quantify the number of species in an area you can be able to identify new or rare species if there are in that particular place. Uh, of course, you can observe uh, the well being of those animals. For example, if you look at this photo, you can clearly see that elephant is, doesn't have any, any issue. So you can be able to see animal well being uh, based using camera traps. For example, if you deploy, if you have, for example, like at, <clears throat> let's say you have a zoo and you like to see, to look at whatever animals you have, 
uh, their well-being. You can use camera traps and deploy them in, in the various locations. And the photos captured then can inform uh, on the well-being of those animals. Of, uh, furthermore, you can be able to identify behaviors and activity patterns. Uh, for instance, if you deploy uh, over large areas, you can be able to tell uh, the ranges of these animals, how they interact. So a camera trap is a versatile tool. You are able to tell, uh, you can be able to you can be able to accomplish multiple uh, research objectives using it. So of course, uh, for us, the corridor utilization is uh, key and you're able to tell uh, data on animal migration. You can be able to tell which animal, which species of animal utilize uh, the corridor over what time, what time of the day, what season of the year. So you're able to tell all that using the camera trap data. Of course, it's uh, I would say it's relatively cost effective compared to other tools because using one camera trap, you can observe multiple animals. Uh, so what is uh, needed to be configured or what do you need to configure on a camera trap so that your data is uh, accurate and uh, so that you, you gain useful information from the camera trap you deploy. So in the camera trap you are able, so this vary based on the model of the camera, but generally these are, uh, the six items that I've listed here are common across uh, a majority of, of the camera traps. So you're able to set the data time. You want to do this because then whatever image that is captured can be correlated to a particular time. If you don't then set the correct time, then uh, when, when you have the images ready for review, you are not able to tell what, uh, what time a particular issue or incident happened. So having the correct data and time is, is very important. Of course, a camera trap can uh, capture either photos or videos and you want to determine uh, before your study uh, if you're going to go the photo route or the video route. For us, we prefer the using photos. And then you can be able to set the number of photos that uh, that camera captures based on a trigger. So a trigger is a movement in the field of vision of the camera. And then uh, you, you can also configure the delay between uh, those photos being taken. So for, is, for instance, if there's a movement and you have set that the camera trap takes five photos, what's the delay between those five photos? So you can configure that. Uh, in our study of corridor utilization, we want to capture the movement as closely as possible. So for us, the delay is set at zero seconds, meaning once a trigger occurs, we take the five photos continuously. Then we are able to capture, in case it was a group of elephants moving, we can be able to capture that uh, movement clearly. Uh, so how does a camera trap uh, trigger? It's triggered by uh, motion in its field of view. Uh, and that is through the sensor that it has as I spoke about earlier, the motion uh, sensor. So that sensor has a sensitivity setting, meaning uh, so for, my, for the majority of camera traps, the sensitivity is either high, low, or medium. At the high sensitivity setting, then uh, the camera is quite, it's able to, det to detect even the small motions that happen in its field of view. So for example, you can see we have cleared the corridor and uh, if this was not in the image, you can see the corridor is cleared. So the grass has been removed. If we had set the uh, camera trap at a high sensitivity and we had blades of grass at the field of view, then those would trigger in case of wind and uh, unusable data would be collected. So you want to, uh, keep in mind 
uh, where you're deploying that camera trap, as you set the sensitivity level. So at the low sensitivity level, then uh, it's it's not so sensitive to motion. The camera is not so sensitive to motion. So it's it's uh, playing with the setting to to match uh, the area of deployment or the objective of your deployment. <clears throat> so the next one is uh, time lapse. You can configure a time lapse setting on camera traps. What this is is you can set the camera to take a video or a photo after every after a given set of a given set of time. For example, let's say every two hours you want to take a photo. This is uh, especially useful if you have uh, the camera traps that have GSM capabilities, meaning uh, that the camera is able to capture a photo and send that photo uh, via GSM to an online portal. So those camera traps, then you can use time uh, this time lapse feature as a, a truthing mechanism to test that the camera is still able to take the photos and it's still able to send. So you can set, for example, every eight hours, send me one, one photo. But this can also be used in uh, research if you want to capture um, photos every few hours or every few minutes, then you can configure that uh, using this feature available in the camera traps. Finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a label uh, when speaking about date and time. So data time uh, appears as a label on the photo taken by the camera. It's also captured as metadata of the image. So in addition to the date and time, you can configure a label saying, uh, describing what that camera trap is or what it does. For instance, in this corridor, we might have three cameras and you want to, to label each camera based on its location. For example, this would be at corner C or something that is understood by the parties conducting the study and something that, uh, on each image then it's uh, shown so that you know uh, this image was from this particular uh, camera trap. So that helps in your data analysis and in your review of the images later on so that you don't confuse uh, which image was taken by which camera trap, especially if you have multiple and multiple uh, camera traps that you are working with. All right, something to note about lock is for us at Olpegeta, we, we deploy our camera traps in uh, cages, as you can see in that image. So these are metallic cages. The reason for that is to protect the camera from uh, animal damage. For example, things like uh, hyenas are usually quite curious and they can come up to where that camera is and try and nimble on the camera. So you want to protect that. So that's why we use these metallic cages. Uh, so we lock them using a padlock so that the camera is safe and safe, safe from uh, damage and animal cannot mess it up. Animals cannot mess it up. So uh, this slide is <laughs> has a lot of words, but uh, the idea is to just try and give uh, a list of basic camera placement guidelines. So these are not cast in stone. Uh, I should say how you place your camera very much depends on what you are studying and the area that you are uh, deploying these cameras. But if uh, as a general guide, I think this would be uh, this would be useful. So you want to consider one, uh, where you have what species you're monitoring. Um, let's say you're monitoring uh, birds, then that would mean that you deploy the camera trap where the nest is and not uh, on the ground. For example, if you're monitoring uh, animals such as lions, then maybe you could want to 
place the uh, camera trap at knee height because lions, I think, are a meter high. So if you are monitoring uh, big species such as elephants, then that would vary where you place, uh, the height you place uh, the camera. <clears throat> Uh, point number two speaks about high traffic areas. So with high traffic, then that would mean high uh, number of triggers because the camera traps are, are best work based on motion trigger. Uh, and that's not what you want. You want uh, you want data that is useful to you for your study. So you don't want every time a vehicle passes or a human passes, then uh, the image is captured because that would be draining your batteries with images that cannot are not useful to your wildlife monitoring. So as you deploy, then uh, you could take that as a consideration. <clears throat> uh, the that point talks about steep slopes and vegetation. Of course, maybe the area you're working with is uh, slopey. So if you can't avoid it, then you'd have to deploy the cameras in those slopes. But maybe you could point the camera to face across the slope and not up and down the slope. But on the point of thick vegetation, I think in the field of view of the camera, maybe you could consider clearly clearing uh, some of that vegetation so that in case of uh, winds and uh, these plants move, uh, or this vegetation shakes, then it doesn't trigger your cameras. So if, uh, for example, at times when you deploy cameras, we, we, we clear or we do some slashing of the area so that the blades of glass, uh, grass don't uh, shake in wind and trigger our, our camera shops. Uh, <clears throat> also consider about uh, the direction of the camera. So, East and West, if at all can be avoided, would be nice because you don't get uh, the camera getting blinded by the sunrise and sunset. Uh, I spoke about the metal cages we we use to prom protect animal from animal damage. Maybe that's, that could be something uh, to try out for your study or to try out for your camera trap de deploy deployment. Of course, normally the camera traps are de deployed uh, on trees, so you can ensure that the deployment, the camera trap is sturdy by using the straps that come with the camera traps. So I don't know if you can see my uh, my video. So let me see. Uh, so yes, this we, what... can, we can see. <laughs> yes. So this is a camera trap. And uh, at the back here, we have some slots that you can have a strap uh, put through. And then you can use that strap to mount this camera on top of, or on a tree uh, stem or branch and uh, to make it sturdy. Some camera traps also come with uh, a screw point like this that allows you to mount it on a, you can screw something uh, on this camera that then uh, goes onto a tree stem and it makes the camera quite stable and steady. Uh, so that's one, one method you can use to, to, to have the camera deployed uh, safely. Uh, <clears throat> all right, uh, let me proceed on. So, on this slide, I show an example of a study that happened in all Pejeta Conservancy. The cameras were deployed in a two by two kilometer grid. The reason for that was the study was monitoring carnivores and uh, those have a home ranges of at least two kilometers. Uh, <clears throat> what we did is uh, the steps we took was we properly configured those camera traps. Of course, first we identified the, the grids, then uh, had the camera traps configured. 
we put them in metal cages as uh, you have seen in the previous slides. A heavy duty hammer was used uh, to drill those cameras onto the ground. The cages were locked and uh, a dead sheet was used to, to capture when these cameras were deployed. So the study was trying to see where our carnivores are across uh, the conservancy. So the legend here shows um, the high numbers and the and, and, and the low numbers, but this for zebra. Uh, so we wanted to relate uh, or to find out if our carnivores are aware the herbivores or rather what they eat. That's where the carnivores are. Right. <clears throat> All right. So the next few slides are uh, mainly images. It just shows the types of photos that uh, a camera trap can capture. The image on the right shows an old model of the Reconix uh, camera trap, uh, <clears throat> camera trap, and it was capturing only black and white images even during the day. But there has been improvement, and today we are able to capture clear uh, colored photos, as you can see on the bottom left of the slide. The labels I was talking about, uh, you can see on this image. So you can see we are able to see the moon face. Uh, you can see the temperature. So it was 33 degrees when this photo was taken. You can see the time and date. So that's important when you're analyzing the data. And you can see the label at the bottom left of the image, the base or its image. So it says corridor two dash B, meaning that this camera was deployed at corridor two at Olpejera Conservancy and its camera number B. So whoever is, receives a data set of images then can be able to categorize these images based on which camera, which corridor, what time, so if you didn't have this, then uh, your work or the data would not be so useful. This just shows a few of the species that we have captured. You can be able to see, or you can be able to tell the co scientific community that there is utilization of the corridors by advax leopards, hyenas. You can even show interaction between species, for example, an impala and jackal. Of course, multiple, multiple images then uh, help prove that. All right. I am at the end of my slides. Thank you so much uh, for listening to me. Thank you so much. Uh, for the opportunity as well to, to speak and talk about camera trapping. Thank you so much, Kennedy. I think that was a good refresher for anyone who's used camera traps before and for anyone looking to uh, start using camera traps. I know this is useful. <laughs> so we'll move on to the Q&A session and just a question to start us off. Um, what's the biggest challenge you're working on right now with camera trapping? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Neti, for the question. So there, there are a few challenges. Uh, I don't know about the biggest, but there are some challenges with using camera traps for monitoring. One is, of course, the safety of these uh, cameras. There are some you can you can have your cameras out in the field and then they get destroyed by animals. They get messed, uh, for example, damaged by hyenas. Of course, the quality of uh, something else that is a challenge is the quality of images. For example, with uh, weather changes, for example, during rainy uh, weather or misty conditions. Uh, so at times the images captured during those conditions uh, then is not the best, but but so that's a challenge. However, generally, 
on normal conditions, the images are good. Uh, of course, I talked about clearing the area of where you're deploying the images. So if you don't have that cleared, then the data that is being collected could be uh, images of movement of, for example, vegetation or grass or things like those and 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 uh not not whatever you're studying so that can be a challenge uh of course uh, the data generated by camera traps is huge so several thousands of images are captured every week so analyzing that is also a challenge so those are the few uh, uh challenges i'll mention Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, Emmanuel, do you want to jump in and ask your question? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kennedy, for the, your presentation. It was very brilliant. I want to do the camera trap and <clears throat> the camera trap video and instruction I've seen is very brilliant. But you mentioned about camera being faced, you should evolve facing the camera from the east or west. Because mm -hmm. when you do so, you will have picture. Um, hi, Emmanuel. I think you on the camera trap, but whenever it is raised, whenever the sun is down, yeah, the internet. If you have a camera face and you have a sound of an animal that have a good sound in the east in the east. Um, I'm really struggling to hear your question, Emmanuel. Uh, Nettie, do you want to read it out? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, Emmanuel, I think your connectivity is a bit uh, shaky. So his question was, um, if you see animal sign in in the east or west direction, what will you do in this case? As I said, the, the, the suggestions are not cast in stone. It would be good if you can avoid having your camera facing. Uh, sorry? But uh, so maybe to answer as you as you uh, go on, uh, have, if you have uh, a need to have your camera facing east or west, then I think the, the need supersedes any uh, direction or any guidelines. Uh, but ideally, it's good because of having the the camera being affected by the sunrise and the sunset to have that camera facing north or south. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I hope Thank that you answers you. I yes. hope that answers you, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the next uh, is Catherine. Do you want to jump in? Nettie, I'm not sure from what Catherine was saying in the chat if she's got connectivity issues. So do you want to read out her question and then you can... Uh, Kennedy can answer. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Catherine is asking, um, what do you recommend to capture moving animals at night without getting blurry images? Um, they have flash cameras to not disturb, especially animals, but are struggling to get clear photos. Uh, I would look at the height placement of the camera trap so that uh, look at the species you are looking to study and adapt the height of the camera trap to that species. Maybe that would solve the issue of the blurry images. Um, as well as look at the delay between uh, the trigger and taking the photo so that the animals as they move, you capture as many photos uh, as you can rather than cap capturing one that uh, could be blurry because the animal is moving quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Harry, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I'm interested to know, I see you use the Reconyx cameras a lot, but which okay. specific models do you use and how do you choose 
for each project, which type of camera you use? Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, what guides us most is the budget that is available. And uh, based on that budget, then we, we choose the best photo for the best camera trap to fit that. Uh, but we, tr we try and go, uh, Recon it has been tried and tested for us and uh, it's working well. So if we can, then we choose that. Yeah, cool. But yeah. Is, there, is there a specific like version of the Reconyx camera that you like to use or like to recommend to people? Uh, well, I would, <laughs> I don't have a specific version, but I give it, I can get it and uh, share with the native, maybe share with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. I don't, mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Yeah. Um, just to add in, I've just dropped in a link in the chat um, for there's a lot of questions coming through about which camera should I use, which specifically one, if I'm going to go buy one, which one. And um, there we had a tutorial in last season from Marcella Kelly, who talked about how do I choose the right camera trapped based on my my interests, goals and species. And that tutorial might also be a nice follow up to what um, questions you guys are asking here. Um, and also, I would also encourage you to jump into our camera trapping group on Wild Labs. Like people are more than happy to give their opinions about different camera trap models there. And we also, so jump in there. If you, if, if you can outline your, what you're trying to do, people will be, experts will be able to give you advice there. Cause I mean, Kennedy, it's a bit hard to um, give advice if you don't know exactly what you're trying to do, like Carly's saying in, in the chat. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, carry on. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Ken. Um, so yeah. our next question is, um, how do you deploy cameras in areas where there's high or high windy conditions and um, what are the things to be considered? if someone is in a low network area. I guess that would be for like GSM cameras. Yes, so for GSM cameras that are in a low network area, then that will definitely affect their, their ability to send the data captured uh, because that's entirely dependent on that network being there and being available. So usually if that's the case and you did the camera there, what that means is you'd have to physically go to the camera, uh, retrieve the camera SD card and have those photos uh, in your laptop or, or somewhere you are able to access them. Essentially, if the network is poor, it would turn your GSM camera trap into a normal camera trap that requires you to visit and collect the data. Mm -hmm. On the item of uh, wind, uh, windy areas with vegetation, I think, uh, of course, if it's windy and there's vegetation vegetation within uh, the vision of or the area of vision of that camera trap, then that will affect the data you collect because every time there's wind, uh, the vegetation is going to move and it's going to trigger that camera. Something to consider would be clearing that vegetation. If uh, for any reason that is not uh, an option and you have to have that camera there, then that would mean the data you collect will have some, some incorrect or some non-useful uh, photos that you then have to eliminate in your uh, review and analysis stage. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ken. So I'd probably relate that to some of the questions we got during registration. A uh, couple of people were wondering how to analyze the data that you've captured from the camera trap. So are there existing models that someone can use and how best can they select the models to use? Uh, so one, I can, I can speak about what we do. Um, so we, we collect this data and we are looking at uh, identifying mainly for the camera traps we have at the corridors, we want to show the utilization over, over time. So 
uh, we want to categorize and over species per species. We want to look at which animals use the corridor at what time. So that, what that means is we need to classify which images contain, let's say a zebra, which images contain a, uh, uh, an elephant and so on. So we do uh, a tool that we have found quite useful is uh, one uh, mega detector. These uh, allow us to eliminate photos that are blank and then to eliminate photos that have uh, humans, for example, vehicles, and uh, we are left only with photos that have animals. So that is usually a large chunk of photos that is done away with. And then our efforts then can be only on those photos that we are sure uh, have animals. So that's one step you can use. The mega detector can be used to assist in your analysis workflow. And then uh, there are some tools, for example, Wildlife Insights uh, by Google that can be able, it's a, an online uh, website where you can upload your photos and it's able to detect uh, what animal that there is. They also, uh, so that is available for people to use. You can also, people can also look at eMammal uh, that is able to, identify sequences of photos and you can be able to work on your photos uh, much, much quickly. So those are the three items I would recommend. So Mega Detector, Wildlife Insights and Imamo. Thank you, uh, Ken. I've shared a few links to some of the tutorials we had on Mega Detector and Wildlife Insights. And I think I'll also share a few more, but um, of Hilash, do you want to jump in and ask a question? Uh, no, he's just said, uh, he's just asked if you could do it for, for Oh, okay, okay. So he'd love to know how uh, to deploy camera traps for arboreal animals like uh, palm kivets and giant squirrels. Um, can camera traps be de deployed up mm -hmm. in the trees to monitor wildlife movement on the ground below? Uh, one, you, I think there are two parts to that question. There's a, I think squirrels are quite small animals uh, that, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm not so sure about the name Aboril, what that means, but I'm going to make an assumption that it means animals similar to the size of a squirrel. Um, so <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, the closer to the ground your camera is, then the better. Um, for example, in the image I showed of an advert, our camera trap is at uh, knee high height and it's able to capture that uh, quite clearly. So that would be something to consider. On the part of if you can deploy animals, uh, camera traps on top of trees to monitor animals, then it, these animals that you're studying can't be small animals. They would have to be large ones that, and the field of view of the, where the animal is or your interest would have to be a bit of a distance from that tree. Uh, but it, it is possible, but not, I think, uh, oh, somebody said aboril means living in trees. So I guess, I guess then uh, the camera traps, are useful. I think you can use, you can monitor any any area uh, of wh wherever the animals are. It's just placing the camera uh, dependent on the environment. So if the animals are on the trees, I would recommend then having those cameras on, well, on those trees. That would be my recommendation. Also, <laughs> not so sure I've answered the question. I think you have. <laughs> yeah, um, we also, sorry, Nettie, we, we also dropped in a couple of, um, there's been some discussions on Wild Labs about arboreal camera trapping and um, some people who have experience. So we've directed um, uh, we've directed to some um, different resources there. So to back up your answer, Kennedy. So do not worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Andre, do you want to jump in? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so I was just out of curiosity. Um, if you could talk to camera makers, uh, what functionality or just a, even a mechanical tweak or something like that, would you like to see in uh, camera models, camera trap models? If you could add one. One feature, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think for something that has impressed me, well, this already exists, is the ability to, uh, one, oh, actually, no, one that I would, I would want, uh, to be able to see the photo captured uh, once. So if you deploy the camera and you want to test that, uh, the image has, or whatever, where you have, how you've angled the camera, it detects motion. Uh, some camera traps, you have to then open up that camera, go in and uh, check the image captured and confirm that indeed. Oh, yeah. yeah, so if there was a screen on top of this camera or at the front that shows you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this, how, yeah. How, how that how that camera how the, that image looks like i think i would want that but that, that's well you can be able to it's not something that is impossible today you can just check on the camera itself yeah yeah but it would uh, yeah spare some work yeah <laughs> <Okay>. that's nice <laughs> yeah. okay right. thank you ken um Steph, do you want to ask yes. a question? Yes. I have a question. Okay. Um, I mean, I always love a big picture uh, question about what do you want from your technology? How do you want it to do better? Um, I, 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 there's been quite a bit of discussion in the chat about um, different uh, new functionality being added into camera traps, like not just connectivity and being able to access images through satellites, but also trying to deploy new tech like um, AI and, and different analytics um, on oh. the edge so that you can process on the camera trap. I was wondering what, what your, what's been your experience so far testing out these new, uh, the emerging developments in camera trapping and, and um, where do you see the field going in the next couple of years? Like what's, what's on the horizon that we should be excited about and paying attention to? Uh, so somebody on the chat already mentioned edge machine learning. So I would like to concur with that person. Uh, it would be nice, especially uh, if you're able to detect species on the camera trap, then you can uh, design your study around, around that. So for example, if you could be able to say, uh, detect, for example, a lion, uh, and especially even from a security point of view, if you could be able to uh, detect things like, uh, weapons and uh, such, then you can deploy camera traps as security uh, security uh, tech to prevent poaching. Uh, that's one thing I would, I would love to see. Um, you could also design, as I was saying, design your study based on such. So you're able to tell which species, uh, it saves you analysis time or review time because then you can detect the species of interest on the camera. So that would be cool to see. Uh, our experience, I think we have tried uh, an AI model to classify some of the images we have, but it's not at the edge. So we retrieve the images and uh, work on them at the office. Uh, the idea is to be able to classify uh, based on species. And uh, we are seeing some, some successes on that front as well. Awesome. Thanks, Kennedy. Thank you, Steph. So I'm aware we are almost at the hour. Um, so I'll just ask a, another question that is probably related to what Steph asked, but um, what is the next big development in camera trapping? And is there anything that you're hopeful or optimistic about? The next big development in camera trapping. Uh, it's a tough question. I would, I would, I would say uh, 
AI and machine learning uh, will be uh, useful or big in the future. I think there's already some successes. For example, Mega Detector is quite impressive for us. Uh, wildlife Insects is uh, super good. But uh, so going on and fine tuning and uh, getting better on that front, I think is what I think would be big in the future for camera trapping, yeah. as well okay. as uh, having it on the edge, especially. Yeah. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, thank you for the presentation and um, thank you everyone for joining, joining us today and making the session very lively. There's been a lot going on in the chat. I hope you've been able to follow through and um, you can also join the camera trap uh, group and ask any questions that were not answered during the session. So the recording for this session will be shared in a few days and you'll be able to access it on Y Labs and our YouTube channel, which you'll receive an email on the same. Our next tutorial will be on 9th March where Mtali Ochieng from Bahari High will take us through a tutorial on how to get started with mobile phones in sea turtle monitoring. So we are moving to the marine side of things. That will be interesting. And before that, we'll have a session, um, our variety our call, which is our community call. And you can join us on the 22nd of February at 4 to 5 GMT and 7 to 8 EAT. Uh, Steph will share the link in the chat that you can use for registration. So conversations will be on chat GPT. I think she's shared that and you're welcome to join us. Thank you once again and have a lovely rest of your day and week. It's been really lovely to have you today. We, we hope to see you in our next sessions. Yeah, I, I will be in the next, well, I'll be in the next sessions. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I, well, I'm thankful. <laughs> it was great. <laughs>